Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 42 and 43. <clears throat> Last week, we looked at Psalm 62. And these are some things that have been on my heart since the end of last year, God has really been doing a wonderful work within me. I am excited. I am encouraged. I believe the Lord is answering some prayers that I have been praying for many, many, many years. Things that I had struggled with personally, things that I just could not connect the dots. I knew there was a problem, I knew there was an answer, but I didn't know how to get from here to there. And I shared with you that at the end of last year, before a trip that Cindy and I was very blessed and fortunate to go on to Oregon, I sought the Lord and said, Lord, I really want you to fix this or take me home. And, and the more I say that, and the more that I think about that, the more serious it kind of becomes to me because at first I was like, well, that doesn't really sound that bad, but I guess it does. There was this urgency. There was this, maybe like Paul in Romans 7 where he says, I'm sick and tired of carrying this body of death around, this stinking corpse. I want to be delivered from this stuff. And the Lord is doing that. And I'm excited about it. Um, and so tonight, we're going to look at Psalm 42 and 43. It's a continuation, really, of, of Psalm 62 and what, what the Lord's doing in me. And I hope that it becomes a blessing and an encouragement to you as well um, if you have struggled with some of the same things. Psalm 42 begins what is known as the second book of the Psalms. The Psalms is divided, if you didn't know, into five different divisions, and they correspond with the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And book two starts at 42, and it goes to 72. And so we're beginning that second book. And it's interesting, I'll just go ahead and tell you now that I'm of the opinion, many scholars are, that Psalm 42 and 43 were originally together, the same psalm. And there's differing opinions on that, but it's interesting in this second book, every psalm in the second book except for 42, I mean 43, I'm sorry, and 71 have titles. And so as we look at these two psalms together, I think it'll be easy for you to understand why I believe they, they went together. Notice in the title it says, To the chief musician, a miskill for the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah were used in temple worship. If you remember, Korah didn't, didn't end up very well. He led a rebellion against Moses and, and the earth swallowed him up and his buddies. But this word miskill here means teaching or instruction, a, a teaching or an instruction. So when this psalm was given to these individuals to sing in temple worship, they understood that there was a lesson to be learned. There was an instruction to be given. There was a teaching to understand. And I truly believe there is. This psalm has three verses, if you will, not in the sense that we do, but think about a song. It has three verses and three courses, a repeated refrain. We'll see in 42.5, that verse, 42.11, same verse with a little bit of change, and 43.5, those verses are repeated. They're the highlights. They're the chorus of this song. And it's been titled by many, a song or a psalm concerning spiritual depression. How would you like to be the choir director and be handed this psalm and say, hey, turn to the hymnal to this psalm. We're going to sing about depression. Depression is 
a real deal. It's a big deal. Many Christians have the idea that it's all in your head, which is just pure foolishness. Those Christians apparently haven't read the Bible. Many people in the Bible suffered from depression, suffered from anxiety, suffered from suicidal thoughts. Some of our faith heroes were people who came to that place where they're like, Lord, just take me out. I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm over this. It's interesting. I like this verse. I'm typically a King James guy, but I like this verse in the New King James. It's Proverbs 12, 25, and it says this. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word will make it glad. A good word will make it glad. And I believe that's what these two psalms are all about. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word will make it glad. And I believe we're going to find in these two psalms, or one psalm, if you will, that hope is the antidote for anxiety and depression. Hope. Hope is the antidote for it. So let's just jump right in. This is, as I said, the second part of the playlist of the Psalms. And the psalmist says this, As the heart, or deer, your translation may say, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. As the heart panteth, after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? Where is thy God? So the psalmist says, As the heart panteth, so panteth my soul. And then he says, My soul thirsts. Now, remember, the soul is the mind, the will, the emotions. I believe it's important for us to remember and understand that, the mind, the will, and the emotions, because when you have a troubled soul, you need to understand there's not just one aspect of the soul. There are three aspects of the soul. And typically, if you have the right part of the soul in charge, the mind can be the tiebreaker. The mind can be the tiebreaker. Most Christians, most Americans especially, their biggest problem is their emotions are in the driver's seat of the soul. Their emotions are in the driver's seat. If I feel like it, I do it. If I don't feel like it, I don't do it. If I feel it, I am. If I don't feel it, I'm not. If you're nice to me, I feel good. If you're mean to me, I feel bad. If the sun is shining, I feel good. If it's raining, I feel sad. Have you ever noticed there's less people at church when it rains all the time? No question about it. There's less people at church. Why is that? Well, it's raining. You know, you can't go out in the rain. It'll kill you. But sugar doesn't melt. It clumps up. Notice in these first three verses, we find the human's three most basic needs for survival. First, the psalmist says, I pant. To pant means to gasp for air. 
Then he says, I thirst, a need for water. And then he says, my meat are my tears, both day and night. So we have air, we have water, we have food. And you can live about three weeks without food. It's true. We can. About three weeks without food. You can go about three days without water. You have about three minutes without oxygen to the brain, without air. But not one second without God. The psalmist says, as the heart, as the deer pants after the water brook, so my soul pants after thee, O God. He says, my soul thirst for God, yea, the living God. He says, when shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? Continually, where's God? Where is God? Why is it that the believer begins to question that God is not there when circumstances and feelings change? Have you ever noticed that? It's easy to believe that God is present, and God is good, and God is great when you feel His presence, when things are going good, and when you're feeling great. But when all of those things change, we immediately begin to question, where'd you go, Lord? Where'd you go? What happened? What happened? Where's God? Where's God? Where's God? Over and over again, where is God? Where is God? He says, my soul thirsts. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Isaiah 12, 3 Therefore, with joy shall you draw waters from the wells of salvation. John chapter 4, verse 14, Jesus says that the water that he gives will be like a well springing up unto everlasting life. John chapter 7, Jesus said that rivers shall flow from your belly, rivers of living water. Just because my soul feels thirsty doesn't mean I'm thirsting to death. The psalmist is feeling dry and faint. You ever felt dryness spiritually? Just dry, just hot, parched, having a hard time breathing. Some of you may be able to relate, some of you may not. There was a period of time in my life that I experienced severe panic attacks to the point that I could not gasp for breath. I literally thought I was dying. Heart beating out of my chest, left arm numb, several trips to the ER for the doctors to say, you're fine, go home. It didn't feel fine. It didn't feel fine. Wake up out of a deep sleep. <gasps> We can't breathe. And then you panic. And then you get in a vicious cycle. And then it just prolongs as the deer pants, as the deer pants. <sighs> pants after the water. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. A good word makes it glad. This, this dryness, this thirst, the psalmist felt. A lot of people experience it. A lot of people experience anxiety, depression. This, this seasons of dryness, it just doesn't feel like God is near. Many Christians check out during those times. If you were walking through a desert and you were feeling parched, the worst thing you could do is just stop. I can guarantee you, you're going to die in the desert if you just stop looking for water. If you just say, I'm just going to sit down right here, you're done. 
You're toast. But how many Christians do that? At the first sign of dryness, at the first sign that they don't feel refreshment from the Lord, they just stop. They just quit. They vacate. Well, he says in verse 4, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul. When is the last time you poured out your soul? We talked about this last Wednesday in Psalm 62, I believe it's verse 8 or 9, one of those verses, I think it's verse 8, where the psalmist says, trust in the Lord, you people, pour out your heart before Him. In Psalm 142, the psalmist says, I poured out my complaint before the Lord. And here he's saying, I poured out my soul. I poured out my soul. One lesson that there is to learn here from the psalm, psalmist when you're dealing with anxiety and depression, one of the most important things you can do is just be honest about it. Far too many Christians are like, I'm fine, I'm great. How you doing? Great, wonderful. Okay, other than being a liar, how are you? I mean, it's written all over your face. Everybody can tell it. You know, it's like, oh, I'm fine, I'm great, I'm wonderful, I'm fine, I'm great, God is good. I'm too blessed to be stressed and all the rest. And, you know, it, come on. Be real. Be real. The psalmist says, Lord, I'm panting for you. I'm thirsting for you. I can't sleep at night. I'm up night and day. My meat, I've lost my appetite. My meat have been my tears. And all I hear is, where is your God? Where is your God? Where is your God? As if I'm being mocked by those voices, constantly saying, where is he? Where is he? He's abandoned you. He's left you. And he says this in verse 4, when I remembered these things, I poured out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude, I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with the multitude that kept holy day. He said, I remember the times when I was in God's presence. You know, when I was standing under the spout where the glory came out. I remember those times. I long for those times. I long for those times. So what do you do when you feel dry and faint? What do you do with feelings and faith during the ups and the downs of life? I got in trouble one time having a conversation with a group of pastors. It wasn't the only time. But I remember this time distinctively. I, I remember another time too, but, but this time distinctively because in our conversation, in our sharing, I said one of the greatest challenges for the Christian is the contrast between feelings and faith. Learning how to live and walk in faith when the feelings aren't confirming the faith. Well, I got smacked a little bit for saying that. Apparently, uh, one pastor didn't want to hear that, but be that as it may, it's, it's fine. I know I was right. And I think he, he did too. He just didn't want to hear it because that's, that's a challenge. That's tough when, when everything in you says that everything here is wrong. When everything in you that you feel contradicts what you read in the text. Look at verse 5. Why art thou cast down? That means to bow down, to be burdened. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted? That means to be stirred within, to literally groan on the inside. Why art thou downcast, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? What's the solution? What's the solution? He says, hope thou in God, hope thou in God. If you remember from our last study, my soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. And we discussed that word means hope, and it also means rope. It's a hope rope. It depends on what we attach that to. Hope in God. Far too many Christians are hoping they feel better tonight. 
I hope after worship and I hope after the message, I feel better. That's not what the psalmist said. Why art thou downcast? He, he, he calls himself to the side and he says to himself, self, why are you downcast? Well, because I'm panting. I'm thirsting. I'm weeping. I'm crying. I just want to come before God's presence. I remember those times when I felt near and dear to him, but, but, but I don't feel that now. I feel dry and I feel faint. That's why. That's why. And the psalmist is saying, that's no reason. That's no reason. Hope thou in God. Because God is not dry. God is not dry. He is the living water, the water of life. He's not dry, nor is he faint, Isaiah 40. He doesn't, he's not faint, neither is he weary. He doesn't slumber. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't get tired. He's all powerful. He's the Almighty. Hope thou in God. Hope thou in God. And then he says this. I love this. For I shall yet praise him. I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. His countenance. That word help there, we're going to find it two other times. It's translated health two other times in verse 11 and verse 5 of 43. But that word, wait for it. You remember in our last study in Psalm 62 that he is my salvation. He is my Yeshua. This word help and health are the same word. For the Yeshua of his countenance, his countenance. In Numbers chapter 6, God told the priests, this is the way you are to put my name on the people. This is the way you are to bless the people. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. And he says, and so shall my people be blessed. He's the help of my countenance. He's the Yeshua. See, when I'm, when I'm dry and faint, I have a tendency to think that God is mad at me. I'm feeling that hot burning of His wrath and His anger. But Yeshua is the help of His countenance. I know He's not scowling at me. I know that He's not angry with me. I know that His face is shining, it is beaming upon me because Yeshua, Jesus, is my help. Why art thou downcast, O my soul? Why? Why art thou disquieted within me because I'm dry, because I'm faint? Pfft, hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him. That's the key. That's the key. You see, when the emotions in the driver's seat I'm dry, I'm faint, and if I'm not careful, my mind will start to ponder and think about how I feel. And then my will will yield, and I will act dry, and I will act faint. How you doing? I'm fair to middling. Or how about this one? I'm hanging in there. <laughs> Who wants to hang? I'm hanging in there. I'm doing the best I can. Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him. Here's what he did. He took himself to the side and he's having a conversation with his soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions. The mind, the will, and the emotions. He says, My, I'm panting, I'm panting. I'm literally panting like a deer running from a hunter or a predator trying to get water. My soul is thirsting for the living God. I want that life-giving spirit of God. I'm weeping, I'm crying. My tears have been my meat. I've lost my appetite. That's what I'm feeling. That's my emotion. 
but I shall yet praise him. If you will put the will in the driver's seat, in obedience and in faith, and let the mind be the tie-breaking vote, I shall yet praise him, for he is God eventually. Maybe not instantly. May not be tomorrow. May not even be next month. Might be next year. Your emotions will follow. They will follow. That's the way God designed the soul. That's why you find so many I wills in the Bible. I will. This is the day Lord has made. If I feel like it, no, I will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. That word expectation I didn't share with you last week in Psalm 62 is the same word expectation in Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith God, thoughts of good and not of evil, to give you an expected end. I will yet praise Him. I'm going to praise Him. Because if it's, if it's not okay, it's not the end, because we know in the end everything's going to be okay, so I'm going to praise Him. I'm going to praise Him. I'm going to praise Him. Even if I'm dry, even if I'm faint, I will praise Him. Interesting. This word praise, some of the young people know this, and some of the chaperones that went on the last young adult and youth trip, we talked about some, some Hebrew words for praise. This word praise here in the Hebrew is yada. And the root word for this word yada is hand. And so this word praise here literally means to extend the hand. So I'm dry, I'm faint, and yet I'm going to lift my hands and I'm going to praise Him. I'm going to lift my hands and I'm going to praise Him. Why do people, you ever wondered, some people are like, why, why do they raise their hand? Why does Gordon raise his hands up there? Well, two big reasons. Number one, this is a universal sign of surrender. No matter where you go, if you do this, you're saying, hey, no, I surrender, I surrender. And so that's what I'm saying. That's what the song, I will yet surrender, I will yet praise Him. I'm going to praise Him because He's the help of my countenance. If my face ever shines again, it's going to glow from his shining face. Like Moses spending time in his presence, his face shined. In 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, I can't remember, I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, that we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. <sighs> some of you are getting it, some of you are like, okay Gordon, let's go at this a little bit more. It took me many, many years. I'm hoping it's not going to be that case. I'm praying that you guys are smarter than, than I am. Why art thou downcast, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Proverbs 13, 12 says this, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. But when desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Here's a question I ask myself, and you can ask yourself. Why is it when you feel dry and faint, you defer your hope? Who told you that when you feel dry and faint, you can't hope? Whoever told you when you feel dry and faint, you can't praise? Who taught you that? Chapter and verse. Where'd you learn it? You didn't. You didn't. That's allowing the flesh to lead and not the spirit man. That, that old man. That old man says, look, man, at the end of this thing, they're going to put me six feet under. So when I'm tired, I'm going to sit down. But the spirit is filled with the same spirit that Caleb and Joshua had a different spirit that says, give me that mountain where the big boys live. That's the spirit of God. That's the spirit of God. God is creative. God is adventurous. God never says, well, Jesus, Holy Spirit, 
A lot of rain in the forecast today. Not so sure. God never thinks like that. He never acts like that. Why do we? Why do I? Why did I spend so many years of my life allowing what I felt to dictate my faith? Because oftentimes, your feelings and your faith are not going to be the same. And if you wait, if you wait like me for those few times when faith and feelings align, and there are those times, and praise God for those times, but they're few and far between. A study was done, interesting, a study was done among believers, Christians and denominations, and those of the Pentecostal denomination, those individuals suffered from depression more than any other denomination. Now, I, I can say this because I got saved in a church like that, so I'm going to be okay to talk about them. Uh, some people might feel uncomfortable doing that. But in that arena, among those individuals, you know, you're in the Spirit 24-7. You're seeing visions and dreams, and you're surrounded by angels and high-fiving them 24-7. There's nothing but miracles, nothing but magical days, unicorns glitter, you know, starry skies and nights, and everything's going to be great and wonderful. You're going to feel great. You're going to be rich and increased with goods, and you're going to have need of nothing. But life doesn't go like that most of the time. And so those people are in a perpetual search for this spiritual bliss. And they rarely achieve that euphoria moment in their lives. And so they live depressed because they don't understand this. Because some preacher told them it's all about how you feel. Now, I'm about to make some of you mad. It has nothing to do with how you feel. Nothing, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Can I remind you tonight that this works everywhere under the sun? It works in every circumstance. It works in every culture. It works for the rich. It works for the poor. It works for the healthy. It works for the sick. It works for the happy. It works for the sad. And none of those things change anything. Why art thou downcast, O my soul? Why? Why is the question? Why art thou downcast? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> well, we got to hurry. 30 minutes in the first point, first verse. It was a long verse. We'll, we'll, the other verses are shorter. Same course, but. <laughs> verse six, he says, oh my God, which begins a new, a new verse. We, we, we go from feeling dry and faint, this description of, of dryness to feeling down and forgotten. This, this feeling of drowning. That's another thing about anxiety and depression. I, I, I don't want to get sidetracked too much here, but I, I shared with you that I've experienced these panic attacks before. And, and praise God, he's delivered me from that. I, I might have it again, have it again one day in my life, but it's been a long, long time. Thank the Lord. But this panting, this, this inability to get my breath, I, I've also felt waves of anxiety and waves of depression. If you've ever struggled with depression or with, with anxiety, you've probably thought this or heard this or read this or, or maybe even described it yourself because I have. I have shared it before with my wife. It's, it's like standing there in the surf, facing the beach, just smiling and waving at life and the people on the shore and having no idea what's about to come. This wave just gathers up steam behind you. You don't know it, and then boom, it just clobbers you and knocks you down. And about the time you get up, boom, you get hit again. There used to be a theme park called Styx River Water World, and I used to go there all the time, and they had this big inner tube ride. You'd go all the way up, and they'd give you this big old inner tube from one of these big 
heavy equipment or buses or whatever, and you get on that thing and you start down and you, you go all over. And finally at the very end, there was this little quick little spurt down into the pool. This big pool had other slides came into it. Well, I came down that thing one time really, really young and I hit that water. And when I did, I slid right off the top of that inner dew. Little skinny as a rail, you know, my, my grandmother buy me pajamas, striped pajamas, it was one stripe, you know. <laughs> I had to run around the shower to get wet, you know, that kind of thing. Little bitty guy slid right off of that inner tube down into the water. Everything would have been great had there not been 40 or 50 other people on inner tubes behind me. And every time I would try to stand up, the water wasn't deep. I tried to stand up, I'd get hit by another inner tube. And I'd come back up and I'd get hit and I'd come back up and I'd get hit and I'd come back up and I'd get hit and I was panicking. I was at the last bit of my breath. And finally, there was this sense of peace or calm or logic, whatever, God's intervention. And it dawned on me, stay down and swim to the side of the pool. Because I kept just, you know, they, they say that the definition of, an, definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. These waves hit and you think you're going to drown. You just think it, it, it's over, you're gonna drown. But I wanna remind you tonight, if you've suffered from this, if you're suffering from it now, it's just a wave. That's all it is. It's just a wave. When it hits you, it's just a wave. It's not a rip current. You know, the rip current is that challenge, that channel between the waves that suck you out. The waves crashing into shore. It's just a wave. And I used to just, just freak out when those waves would hit. You say, why are you talking about waves? Well, let's read. Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. He, he's admitting it. Therefore will I remember thee. So, so when you're feeling faint, when you're feeling dry and faint, the first thing you need to do is remember to praise. Remember to praise and respond in faith. Now, when you're, you're feeling down and forgotten, the first thing you need to do, verse six, is remember to ponder. Now, there's a lot of things that cause depression. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not going to get into all that. I've read some books. Uh, I, I slept in one of those, what's a hotel that makes you really smart? I slept in that last night. So, no, I'm just kidding. Um, Holiday Inn Express. No, I'm just kidding. I, all I know is from my own experience, but there's, there's all types of reasons, reasons for it. But one of the greatest reasons, I believe, is stinking thinking. Here's a question you can ask yourself. What do you think about when you're in the valley? What do you ponder in the valley? What do you think about in the valley during those times? He says, I remember thee from the land of Jordan and from the Hermonites, from the hill Mizar. We won't spend a lot of time there, but Jordan, the Jordan River, Jordan in Hebrew means descending or depths. Mount Hermon is the tallest mountain in all of Israel. It has three peaks. It's, it's the highest point in Israel. And, and Mizar means small or little hills. He says, he says, when my soul is cast down, I remember, I ponder, I, I think back to my highs, to my lows, and everywhere in between you've been with me. You've been with me. You've never failed me. You've, 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 you've never, you've never forgotten me. Just because I'm down doesn't mean I'm going to stay down. I'll be up again, and then I'll be down again. And then I'll be up again, and I'll be down again. Feelings and faith during the ups and the downs. Then he says this, verse 8, Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. 
your loving kindness in the daytime. We need to be spending time forgetting our miseries. <laughs> and the best way to forget your miseries is to focus on his mercies. That's the best way. We tend to focus on our miseries. We, need, we tend to focus on what's wrong. I feel bad. I feel bad. I feel bad. How are you? I feel bad. I feel bad. I feel bad. How are you? I feel bad. I just feel bad. I just, whew, I just feel bad. And the more I, I, I think about it, the more bad I feel. The badder I feel. It's amazing how that happens. Verse 9. He says, I will say unto my God, I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? So he, he, he feels downcast. He feels forgotten. Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, my, enemy, my enemies reproach me. While they say daily unto me, where is thy God? There it is again. Where is your God? Where is your God? Who told us? Who taught us? that there was a certain feeling that went along with God's nearness. I've had people say, I don't feel saved, Gordon. I'm like, wow, you need to go talk to somebody else because I don't even know what that feels like. What do you mean you don't know how it feels like? You're saved, aren't you? Absolutely, I'm saved. But the Bible doesn't tell me how saved feels. It's amazing. Christians get saved and this Christian gets saved and they weep and cry like a baby. And so they, they look around the room and if nobody's crying like a baby, then whoop, nobody's getting saved. What? This Christian gets saved and they laugh and they're joyous and they look around the room and they see people crying they're like, you're not saved, you're crying. What does it feel like? I don't know. Does it matter? Well, of course it matters because that's the most important thing in the world, Gordon. The most important thing in life is how I feel. That's the most important thing, how I feel. Now we've got special rooms for how we feel and teddy bears and coloring books. It's getting crazy. We're, we're so wrapped up in our feelings. The psalmist is, is talking about dryness and being faint. The psalmist is talking about being down and forgotten. These are real feelings. And he's expressing them before the Lord. He's not hiding them. He's not, he's not making, making excuses for them. He's saying, this is how I feel. But, look at verse 11. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. Hope in God. Hope in Him. For I shall yet praise Him. I'm going to praise Him. When I'm feeling dry, I'm going to praise Him. When I'm feeling faint, I'm going to praise Him. When I'm feeling down, I'm going to praise Him. When I'm feeling forgotten, I'm going to praise Him. Why? Because he's the health of my countenance and my God. There's a shift taking place. There's a shift taking place. See, first he says, his countenance. It's his countenance. Oh, Lord, shine your face upon me. But the more time I spend looking, that's why the writer of Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, we find the glory of God in the face of Jesus. It's looking to Him, not my circumstances, not my feelings, not what's going on in my life, looking to Him. And next thing you know, my face is aglow. It amazes me. I've watched believers who have serious problems, suffered serious loss, dealing with serious illness, and yet there's a smile on their face. There's joy in their heart. They've got this, this bright outlook about the future. And you can't fake that. That's the real deal. Why art thou downcast? It's a good question you can ask yourself tonight if you are. Why? Why are you bummed? Why are you depressed? Why are you sad? Why are you anxious? Why? What is it? Name, name the anxiety. Name the fear. Name the problem. For God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Everything that you can name. Every sickness that you can name. Every sorrow that you can name. Every problem that you can name. Every syndrome that you can name. His name is above it. 
Why art thou downcast, O my soul? Hope thou in God. See, what God's trying to do in my life, in your life, is a spiritual thing. It is an eternal thing. But, but I'm so wrapped up in the natural. I'm so wrapped up in the carnal. I'm so wrapped up in the temporal that I fail to learn what God's trying to teach me in the ups and the downs. The ups and the downs. You say, well, Gordon, this is sounding like power of positive thinking. Nope, it's not that at all. I don't believe in the power of positive thinking. You can't think something, anything. That's why my expectation is the Lord. I'm, not ex I'm expecting to get rich tomorrow. You're going to be discouraged tomorrow because that ain't going to happen. My expectation is the Lord. Why are you downcast, O oh, my soul? Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. What are you deferring your hope over tonight? Is it a feeling? Is it a problem? Is it a circumstance? Is it a financial matter? Is it a health? What, is, it, is it a relational issue? What are you deferring your hope? Why are you letting that thing defer your hope? Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And then you wonder, why do I feel like this? I don't have any energy. I don't have an appetite. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to go anywhere. I don't want to talk to anybody. It makes sense. And you're sitting there thinking, there's something seriously wrong with me. No. Everything's operating normal. This isn't normal, Gordon. Yeah, it is. When you let the way you feel dictate what you do instead of faith. When you allow yourself to think about yourself instead of your God. When you let your circumstances, instead of your calling and His promises, be what dictates your life, it makes perfect sense why you're in the condition that you're in. And, and I can say this without being judgmental because I spent most of my life here. And I'm, ju I'm just like that far out of this. <laughs> I'm just learning. I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I'm not even in kindergarten yet. I, I'm, just, I'm just reading it on the marquee outside of the elementary school. Hey, they're teaching that there. <laughs> I'm just at that level. He says, why are you downcast? Well, 43, verse 1. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man, for thou art the God of my strength. He says, why dost thou cast me off? So he's feeling distant and forsaken. What he's describing here is darkness. This idea that, that God has cast him off. He says, why do I go mourning over the oppression of the enemy? And then, verse 3. So, when you're feeling dry and faint, you need to remember to praise, as in verse 4. And then you need to respond in faith. When you're feeling down and forgotten, starting in verse 6. You need to remember to ponder and then respond in faith. Praise the Lord all the time. Ponder, think on these things, Paul says in Philippians. And then, when you're feeling distant and forsaken, remember to pray. Verse 3. O oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me and bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Bring me to where you are. Lift me up to where you are. You're not down and out. Lift me up. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding, what? Joy. My exceeding joy. God is my exceeding joy. So, feeling good is my joy. Er. Having enough money to pay the bills is my exceeding joy. Er. Not having any problems at the moment is my exceeding joy. Er. Being liked by everybody around me is my exceeding joy. Er. We just go down the list. God, you are my exceeding joy. If he's my salvation, he is my rock, he is my fortress, he's my high tower, he's my strength, he's my exceeding joy, he is my expectation. Do you see a pattern here? If he's all those things, then none of this matters. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I want to feel good. I want to be healthy. I want all my bills paid. I'd like to have a little extra money in the bank. Yeah, I, I'm human. I, I want all those things too. And that's my prayer and that's my hope. I wish above all things that you'd prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. But it's not always that way. Sometimes there's seasons. Sometimes there's, there's long periods of life. And so during those times, am I just going to say, well, let's just pack it all up. I'm packing up my joy. What are you doing? I'm, I'm just going to put this in my hope chest and hope one day that I can have hope. Do you know the, the writer of Hebrews says that Abraham believed hope against all hope. Against all hope, he believed in hope. The Bible says hope doesn't make a shame. It doesn't let us down. And he, he says here that you're, you're my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God, my God. He says, I, I want to go to the altar. Now, we tend to go to the altar because we want something. So, I feel bad, so I'm going to go to the altar because I want God to make me feel good. I'm having problems with my marriage, so I go to the altar because I want God to fix my marriage. I, I need a job, so I go to the altar so God will give me a job. Notice what he says. I'm going to go to the altar of God, unto God. Unto God. We get it mixed up in the church today. We, we, we think God is a means to an end. God is the end. He's also the means, but He is the end. He's what satisfies my thirst. He's what satisfies my hunger. He's my exceeding joy. He's my strength. He's all those things. And none of these things can move me if he is those things. And then he says, verse 5, Why art thou downcast, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him who is the health of of my countenance and my God. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, Proverbs says. But when desire comes, it's a tree of life. What is your desire? Well, I desire to feel better. I desire to be happy again. I desire my circumstance to change. You're deferring your hope. You are deferring your hope. You're saying, when this happens, I will. And the psalmist says, I will yet praise him. I'll praise him when I'm dry and faint. You're going to see me lifting up my hands, surrendering to him. And I just remember the Holy Spirit reminded me that I didn't tell you the second picture that this hand raising is. Not only is it a universal sign of Surrender, but those of you who are parents, grandparents, or have little kids around, it's hold me, hold me, hold me. I'll yet praise him. I'm going to stand on my tippy toes in the dry seasons. I'm going to stand even though I'm faint on my tippy toes and I'm going to say, Lord, I surrender. I praise you. Hold me. When I'm down and feel forgotten, hold me. Hold me, Lord. Hold me. When I feel distant, when I feel like you've turned your back and you've forsaken me and darkness is swallowing me up, which can't, right? You know that. We get to John chapter 8. Jesus says, whoever follows me shall not walk in darkness. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. As a matter of fact, the psalmist says that darkness and light are the same with him. Do you know that God can't walk in a dark room? He can't. Because the moment he walks in, there is no darkness. There's none. So even when it feels like darkness is surrounding me, and that's, that's another thing. So, so this dryness, it's a feeling of anxiety, depression. This, this, I, this feeling of drowning, it's a feeling of anxiety and depression. And this, this feeling of darkness, I've woke up early in the morning feeling like I was absolutely in the midst of outer darkness, shaking uncontrollably in absolute terror before, having no reason to do so, but terrified. But did you know that I wasn't in darkness? It's just a feeling. It's just a wave. 
it's just a wave. It's just an illusion. I'm not thirsty because he's my living water. I'm not drowning because he's my savior. Remember Peter? Help, Lord. Immediately, he lifted him up. Immediately, he lifted him up. And I'm not in darkness. But Gordon, it sure does feel like it, doesn't it? Sometimes, it does. But the worst thing I ever did was living by those feelings. It was the absolute worst thing that I ever did. I've had people say, well, Gordon, when I do these things you're talking about, it doesn't change how I feel. And your point? And they get upset. They get, they'll get mad at you at this point. <sighs> Does it matter how you feel? When did this ever become about feelings? It's about faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Faith is the substance of things felt for. Wait a minute. No, I got that wrong, didn't I? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. The prophet says, let the weak say, I am strong. What is that about? Let the weak say, I am strong. I feel defeated. I feel so defeated. But I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me. My enemies have surrounded me there against me. But if God be for me, who can be against me? I feel so defeated, but he always causes me to triumph. Respond in faith. Remember to praise. Remember to ponder. I think I skipped a verse. I did skip a verse. I love the Holy Spirit. I love the Holy Spirit. We skip. I, we. You, don't you love how I just throw you onto the bus with me? Verse 7, real quick. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. All thy waves and thy billows are gone okay. over me. During those times in my life and those times possibly in the future, most likely, probably in the future, when I feel like I'm going under, when I'm drying up, I'm going under, and I'm being swallowed by darkness, deep calls to deep, at the, the noise of thy water spouts, thy waves and thy billows are going over me. I used to think, I'm going down. I'm going under. This is it. It's over. But you know what I'm coming to learn and realize? And maybe some of you need to realize this tonight. During those times when deep is calling to deep, what you need to do is get deep with it. Run to the roar. Run to the roar. For your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, roaming about, seeking whom he may devour. As, the Bible doesn't say he is. He is as. There's a roar, but there's no teeth. There is no teeth. I shared this before. I'll share it real quick. When I was a new Christian, struggling with some spiritual warfare at the time, and it was a Friday night at a youth meeting, and I, I slipped out. I was just in a really bad place, kind of what we're discussing here. And so I went behind the church. There was this little alley behind the church that I got saved at, and there were houses behind that church, and, and there were big air conditioner units back there, and I just slipped between two of those, and I was just sitting there up against the back of the church in the dark. I was just seeking God and crying out to God. Nobody was there but just me, just seeking Him. And out of nowhere, out of nowhere in this backyard, 
It's funny now, but it wasn't funny then. This dog comes bolting from the front yard into the backyard. But he makes no noise until he slides like at home plate right up to the fence, closer than me in this front row. He just slides. And when he hits the fence, he just starts tearing and barking. Scared me to death. I'm sitting in the dark. My eyes are closed. It's been 15, 20 minutes. I've forgotten about my surroundings. Nobody knows where I'm at. And I'm just seeking the Lord. And out of the nowhere, this dog just starts growling like he's going to eat me alive. <gasps> I mean, talk about a panic attack. And I just sit back. And as soon as that happened, I'll never forget it. Never forget it. The Lord said, that's the way your enemy is, Gordon. Run to the roar. He is barking, he is snarling, he is slobbering, but there's a fence between you and him. And you've got to get to the place, young man, where those growls stop moving you. When you, when you, when you stop, stop praying when you hear it. I stop praying, I stop seeking, I stop thinking about the Lord, and I was consumed with that moment. Terror flooded me, just, and all I could think about is that dog. Just, but he couldn't do anything to me. And he couldn't hurt me. And he couldn't touch me. But I was paralyzed. It's just a wave. It's just a feeling. It's just a circumstance. It's just a brief moment. And all of eternity. And that's why Paul says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time cannot be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. When those waves are crashing over, go deep. Don't panic. <sighs> Trying to get to the surface, <gasps> go deep. The psalmist says, thy thoughts toward me are very deep. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says that you would understand the height, the depth. Go deep. Just go deep into the love of God, not in the depths of despair, not into the depths of darkness, not in the depths of drowning, not into the depths of dryness. Go deep into the love of God. And Paul says in Corinthians chapter 2 that the Spirit of God searches the deep things of God. Go deep. What you need more than anything during those times is to go deeper. Ezekiel 47, just go deeper. He's going to keep you alive. He's the breath of life. You're not going to drown. He's not going to let you. Isaiah says, though you walk through the waters, I'm going to be with you. And through the floods, they're not going to overflow you. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Hope thou in God, I shall yet praise him, for he's the help and the health of my countenance. My face, it's going to shine in the dry times. It's going to shine. I'll be a fool glorying in Christ. Paul says, I'm going to glory in my tribulation. Paul says, when, I'm, when you see me out in the desert, my lips are all cracked and my face is riveled up like a a mushroom or no, like a raisin, whatever. He says, I'm going to be praising God. I'm going to be praising Him. Praise the Lord. With joy shall you draw from the wells of salvation. And you're a nut. His countenance is on me. You're about to die. <laughs> to live as Christ, to die as gain. He's going to be that guy out there in the ocean. <gasps> Smiling. Hey, y'all, how you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm going deep. The enemy's going to grab your ankle. He's going to take you down. I bet I can go deeper. I bet I can go deeper. Well, Gordon, that's arrogant. No, 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 no. The Spirit of God searches the deep things of God. I'm just going to free dive. I'm just going to let him take me to however deep he wants because he's going to reveal himself to me. Remember Jonah? Man, I could go on and on. I have went on and on. This is, this is changing my life. There's so much of this. I hope and pray that God 
will allow you to, to catch hold of this. Because I've wasted so many years. So many years I'll never get back. So much time I will never, ever, ever get back. Now he redeems the time. It's all good. God's going to work it out for his good. And praise God, I'm, I'm starting to learn it. But man, hope in him. Hope in the Lord. Victor sang a song, last verse, I promise. In Hebrews chapter 6, the writer of Hebrews says that we're to lay hold of this hope, which hope is an anchor for our soul. And the writer says, it extends behind the veil. Wherefore, our forerunner, which is Christ, has gone for us. That means Jesus at the right hand of the Father in the Holy of Holies in God's presence is there already. And attached to him is, well, he is that anchor and attached to him is that rope, that expectation, that hope rope. And I've tied it around my soul. And it doesn't matter what I go through because here's what he's doing. And with every passing day and every passing moment, he's pulling me ever closer through every trial, through every circumstance, through every trouble. I'm just getting closer and closer and closer to him until one day. <laughs> Hope springs eternal, man. I'm going to see him as he is. Oh, let's pray, Lord. We thank you tonight for your word. We thank you that you are our strength, you are our salvation, you are our help, you are our health, you're our exceeding joy, you are our living God, you are our fortress, you are our rock, you are a high tower, you are our living water, you are our light, you are our love, you are rejoicing, you are our hope, you are our expectation. Lord, you are our all in all, and you change not. Which means none of these things are ever going to change. Oh, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. We hope in you. And we thank you tonight that your countenance is shining upon us. We thank you, Lord, that you are beaming over us. Would you teach us, Lord, to enjoy the joy of you enjoying us? Teach us how to enjoy the joy of you enjoying us. Let us enjoy you, Lord. Let us hope in you. Put our expectation in you. Help us, Lord, to maintain our faith no matter what we are feeling. In Jesus' name.